Hello, everyone. Welcome to our, I guess it's April, right, Michelle? Our April webinar, our April Upchurch Watson White and Max webinar. We are going to get started right on time today, and we're going to be discussing your clients, brain, and mediation. I like the subtitle of this that I have coined myself, which is the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> right, Michelle? <laughs> That's great. That's good, Sandy. I like that, too. <laughs> some, so, some things you want to know, some things maybe you'd rather just not be a part of. <laughs> I am your moderator today. My name is Sandy Upchurch. I am mediation counsel with Upchurch Watson, White, and Max. And no, I am not the Upchurch and Upchurch Watson, White, and Max, but that is my father-in-law, whom I love dearly. Um, our presenter today is my very good friend and colleague, Michelle Jernigan, who is a shareholder at Upchurch Watson, White, and Max. And Michelle, how long have you been with the firm? I have been with the firm for 22 years. I have learned so much from Michelle as far as what to do and how to do it and how to uh, really um, get started in this field. And I have, I'm very grateful to her. Uh, her and to Kim Sands both have really kind of uh, shown me the way and held my hand along the way and kicked me in the butt when I needed it. So I have, I'm grateful to, to both of them. And I'm very grateful to Michelle for agreeing to do this program today. She has spent a lot of time preparing and getting ready and has a phenomenal Phenomenal presentation for all of you. We are expecting to go from noon till about 1.15 today, so you can get a full hour and a half of Florida Bar CLE credit, and you will enjoy every minute of her presentation. Before we begin, uh, let me remind you that we are presenting this today with the um, Florida um, Law School, the University of Florida Levin College of Law Dispute Resolution Institute, and we are proud to be co-sponsoring with them every time. And of course, Upchurch Watson, White, and Max is our um, our um, our main uh, what are we our main sponsors. So um, Michelle, before we get started, let me go through some technology stuff. Uh, everybody should be seeing on their screen a toolbar, and uh, it's probably in the way of your beautiful PowerPoint. So if everyone would like to move that out of the way, they can hit the orange arrow that is facing to the right, and that should eliminate that toolbar. If you do have questions, I am not 100% sure that we're going to have time to take those on air today, but we will certainly make sure that you get them answered. If we have time, we'll do it on the air. If not, I will send your questions and inquiries directly to Michelle, and she will make sure that she responds to them uh, um, promptly after the webinar because your questions are very important to us. Um, so we've minimized the screen. Uh, we've talked about the um, the question and answers for today. As far as the CLE number, we're going to give you that information at the very end of the webinar. It will be on the last screen, so make sure you stick with us to get that CLE number. And then all you've got to do uh, after you're done with the webinar is go to the Florida Bar website and plug in the CLE information so you can get that. So our panelist today, obviously, is Michelle Jernigan. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Michelle, because you have a full, uh, a full uh, agenda, and I don't want to take up any more of your time. Well, thank you for your kind words, Sandy, and it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to work with you today. In fact, if you weren't here, I probably wouldn't tackle this by myself from the technological standpoint. And I want to say good afternoon to our participants, whether you're lawyers, clients, friends, whomever you are, we welcome you, and I'm glad to have you in on this presentation. I think you're going to find it very interesting, as did I. I wanted to give you a couple of things about myself that you probably wouldn't know. I actually started out in college as a biology major. I wanted to be a physician. And it came time for organic chemistry, and I just looked at that book, and I saw, <laughs> I saw all these other pre-med students leafing through this 800-page book on a Friday night, and I just decided I couldn't live my life that way. So um, I, you know, very, put a tremendous amount of thought in this, you know, as a young person. I just flipped open the college book that we had at Stetson, and I said, okay, what can I get a Bachelor of Science in? 
oh, political science, that'll work, I'll do that. And so I really was always a, a science person, um, but I ended up becoming a lawyer and then, of course, becoming a mediator. But um, my interest in science was rekindled when I took a class called Neuroawareness for the ADR Practitioner. So today, I'm going to convey to you some of the information I learned in what was a 14-week class where we met by webinar an hour and a half a week. So, you know, it was quite extensive. And what I've tried to do is boil that down and put it in a succinct fashion for you to try to give you a few tips and pointers so that it will aid you in working with your clients, not only in mediation, but also just in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. So um, what I'm going to talk about is your client's brain in mediation. But what we're going to explore today obviously can be used in a variety of settings. And before we start, or at the beginning of our presentation, we're going to explore some basic brain facts. Now take a look at the information on the slide. And some of these facts were really quite surprising to me. I want you to look at the relative size of the brain compared to its draw on energy. And when I talk about energy, I talk about it generally. Blood flow, oxygen, glucose. Look at the percentage of body glucose, 25%, that is utilized by the brain. And of course, without the right levels of oxygen and glucose, there would be brain death. Now, with the 25% of total body glucose being used by our brains, who says that a sedentary job doesn't require a lot of energy or food? But the learning tip for you here is that we want to make sure that clients are well fed in mediation, negotiation, and in any decision making mode. Now, we're going to explore the brain. There's, there's so many different ways to look at the brain because the brain is such a complex organ. But we are going to examine the brain today from the standpoint of functionality. So that's going to give us basically three brains. We're going to have the emotional brain, the social brain, and the cognitive brain. Now the neocortex is that part of the brain that is associated with the cognition. And cognition, of course, would include planning, language, logic, will, awareness, all of what you would think of as the executive functions. We also, of course, are going to have, from a functionality standpoint, the emotional brain. This is often referred to as the limbic system. This is where we have feelings, relationship, nurturing, images, dreams, play. This is, this is where we have our goofiness. You know, this is where we have our sense of humor. And then the reptilian brain, which you've probably heard of, the instinctual, that's more in line with the auto automatic breathing, swallowing, heartbeat, startle response. So what we're going to do as we go forward, we're going to break the brain down into three categories, the emotional, the social, and the cognitive. And we're going to start with the emotional brain. Did you have something you were going to say, Sandy? Well, I was just, I guess you could hear me breathing. I'm sorry I'm the heavy breather over here. I just, <laughs> you know, I've heard of the reptilian brain called the, that's the fight or flight response. Is that, is that right? Or am I? Actually, you're going to hear that that's more a function in the emotional brain. Okay, great. I can't wait to yeah. hear about it. Yeah. So anyway, um, have you ever, so here we are with the emotional brain and, and it involves the limbic system, which we talked about, also involves the neocortex, because that's where the senses are first processed in the neocortex and brought into the emotional part of the brain. The, the emotions are generated in the emotional part of the brain, and this is, of course, where we experience, and notice I'm saying experience, uh, I chose that word very purposefully. That's where we experience our responses or reactions to stimulus. So now think for a minute, have you ever noticed how certain smells will actually bring a feeling to you? Well, those smells are being processed first in your emotional brain before 
you have some cognition regarding them. So before, before you mentally are saying, oh, that smells like ginger, um, your emotional brain is actually processing it first. And what might be an even more powerful stimulus for feeling is, could be associated with what we see visually. So we're going to take a little bit more in-depth view of this emotional brain that I've just described to you. And I'm going to talk about the amygdala. And we reference that as the rapid relevance detector. And the amygdala is a really critical part of the emotional brain. And you're going to hear me refer to it as we move through the presentation. This part of your brain integrates information from other parts of your brain. And it basically makes a conclusion based on one simple principle, fear or reward. And as you would expect, we're going to avoid danger and we're going to approach reward. Now, it's kind of interesting because the amygdala has a very similar twofold response to faces. When you see someone's face, your amygdala, without any conscious thought, so this is the emotional part of your brain processing this, without any conscious thought, the amygdala is making a determination as to whether or not this face is one worthy of trust or is this face one of dominance and therefore perhaps in the fear category. Now we'll move over to the hippocampus, which is also part of our emotional brain. And what it does is it ties memories to emotional events. It is fragile and it is easily damaged. And if you do studies in people who have PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, you will see that the hippocampus has been permanently altered due to their severe exposure to stress. So, you know, if, if you wonder about what happens to people with PTSD, now you have a little bit better understanding of it. They actually have a part of their brain structure that has been altered as a result of acute severe stress. Now we're going to take a look at the hypothalamus. And this works bi-directionally with the amygdala. So in other words, the amygdala and the hypothalamus are sending signals back and forth to each other. So now you can understand why there is a connection, and it's not really a conscious connection. It's, it's done through the emotional brain, not at the conscious or cognitive level. Um, that we might have some changes in body temperature, hunger, thirst, fatigue, sleep cycles as a result of what we're perceiving emotionally. And I'm sure you've all personally um, experienced that. Now we're going to talk just a little bit about the PFC or the prefrontal cortex. Most of you have probably heard of this, the PFC, the prefrontal cortex. Um, but to me, one of the things that's very interesting at this point in the presentation is it was the study of this part of the brain that actually gave birth to the field of neuroscience. In 1848, there was a gentleman named Phineas Gage. And he was a Vermont railroad worker. He was out on the job site. There was a terrible explosion. And a rod came into his cheek and went up through the top of his head. It did exit out of his skull, and he did survive. But the problem with good old Phineas Gage is he was never the same. What was previously a nice, young, 25-year-old, gentle man became a very rude, crude, and vile individual he was, it, with regard to his speech and his actions. And as a result of all that, scientists discovered that his prefrontal cortex had been damaged and that he lacked the ability to monitor his emotions. So we're going to hear a little bit more about this later in the presentation. But basically, the prefrontal cortex is the monitor for the emotional part of the brain. 
Michelle, I've heard in um, many of my mediations that involve um, head injuries that uh, very, very rare is the individual that suffers um, an injury that doesn't have some sort of long-lasting and a, a permanent change in their behavior and their conduct. So what you just said is obviously the, 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 the reasoning and the science behind that. Oh yeah, I mean you see you see it all the time. You see it when you're working with those folks and you know, particularly when you hear from their friends and family members, they really are never the same. Hmm. So now we're going to look at the association uh or not the association, but that dichotomy, fear, danger. Of course we all fear danger and our reward, we're going to analogize that to pleasure. We're definitely all more sensitive to fear than, than we are reward. I remember when I was taking this class, I asked my dad just out of curiosity's sake, I said, Dad, what do you think is the greatest motivator? Do you think it's reward or fear? And interestingly enough, he said reward, but the truth is fear is a, is a much bigger motivator of people's behavior than reward is. And, and there's a reason for that. If you think about um, we're, we're made and designed for survival. And so fear would certainly be a more motivating factor than reward. Now, I want to talk just a little bit here about dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. It is released during reward, and it is also released in anticipation of reward. And I want to cite to just an example that's near and dear to my heart, which is chocolate cake. So if you are looking at a luscious piece of chocolate cake, you are going to be releasing, if that's something that you love to eat, you're going to be releasing dopamine the minute you start looking at that piece of chocolate cake. So, you know, we often hear about people um, salivating as a result <laughs> as a result of looking at something that looks good to them uh, there's a reason that that happens because dopamine is being released now you eat a piece of the chocolate cake and it exceeds your expectations so now you'll actually have more dopamine release if the stimulus in this case being the chocolate cake um, does not meet your expectations then of course you know, you're not going to release any more dopamine. And then, of course, the opposite of dopamine or the reward hormone is our fear hormones. And all of these that you see here listed are made by the adrenal glands. And, you know, this gets very complex. I mean, this field is extremely complex. And, um, I am, I am going to say this, it's not really in the materials anywhere, but some of these chemicals, and that's what I'm going to call them generally, uh, are hormones, and some of them are also neurotransmitters. Uh, a hormone is typically made by the glands and reduced in the blood, and neurotransmitters are chemicals that are actually released in the neurosynapsis. So, but, but I'm, I'm not sure that I totally understand why some of them can be both, but some of these fear hormones are actually neurotransmitters as well. Probably a little bit more information than you need, but um, if you've ever had blood work and if you've had your cortisol levels tested, uh, then well, I'm sorry, if you've had blood work, you probably have had your cortisol le levels tested. And the reason for this is physicians want to know if you have e elevated levels of cortisol because that can lead to very serious health problems. And you can see when you look at the slide that some of these hormones are released uh, right away. Some of them are released more or less over time and are longer lasting. So they do serve different functions, which is why we have each one of them. <clears throat> now I want to look a little bit at a comparison between the fear and reward. And I want you to note how the fear is faster acting but longer lasting. And I also want you to look at what you see relative to cognition and dominance. 
you see here that they're, you're less likely to dominate if you're in a reward mentality and more likely to dominate in a fear mentality and probably more importantly for our purposes in mediation, in negotiation, in working with our clients, look at the cognitive capacities are down when someone is experiencing fear, when our clients are afraid, cognitive capacities are down and when they're in a reward setting, cognitive capacities are up. And you can also see, relative to a client being in mediation, the adversarial capacities up when there's fear and collaborative up when there's reward. So bottom line is our brains are extremely complex organs and they're highly, highly integrated. You know, what I think is interesting about that, Michelle, is that it's interesting to see you actually put on, on here that the, the lows do last longer and highs do, do not last as long as the lows. I, I think that's fascinating. I know that I've experienced that in my life. And I, just generally speaking, not even in mediation, and that's a fascinating fact to comprehend when you're dealing with clients at mediation, for sure. Well, think about, think about when something makes you laugh or and you're enjoying something, obviously you're, that's a reward type of response. Um, and think of how quickly that can fade mm -hmm. if you're exposed to a stimulus that's fearful. And think about how long it takes to come, de come away from the fear. I am, and it's amazing to me. I've never really had it explained to me that way, so thank you. Now, one of the techniques that I have actually used in mediation as a result of attending this class is, um, is that you know feelings feelings are being generated by that emotional brain and and the amygdala is very active in the generation of those feelings and that amygdala is receiving and transmitting information regarding those feelings and then at the same time our prefrontal cortex is trying to regulate those feelings and so when in mediation if a client needs to express emotion obviously mediators we call that venting um, I'm just going to share with you that if there's too much of that then the person is continuing down the path of fear, okay? But if there's a certain amount of it, in other words, if the person has the opportunity to express emotion and that if either the lawyer who represents them or the mediator can name what they're feeling, I found this to be a very interesting technique that can be used. If, the, if that neutral or the lawyer can name the feeling, oh, I see that you're sad. Oh, I see that, that this concerns you or, or might make you afraid. Um, the person can actually start moving away from emotion to cognition. And, you know, you have to realize that in the kind of work that we all do, we need our clients to be, they're going to be in the emotional mode to some extent, but for good decision making to occur, we really need to be them, in, need to have them in the cognitive mode. And so, before we move forward from this slide, I just want to say one more thing about mediation and fear and reward. We use both of these in mediation. We use fear and we use reward. And the bottom line is we need to balance the two. Some of the fears you might, your client might encounter in mediation are losing at trial. Maybe the fear of settling for too little money. Maybe the fear of making a mistake by settling. Maybe there's some fear associated with coercion. Maybe they feel coerced into a settlement by the opposing side or maybe even by the mediator or maybe even by their lawyer. Um, but we also need to be aware of what the rewards at mediation might be. Closure. You've seen that sigh of relief when parties enter into an agreement and they actually have closure over this issue and this lawsuit. Crafting their own resolution, that's empowerment. You know, when you have the ability to participate in your own resolution, that empowers you. Avoiding a bad outcome, avoiding uncertainty, these, of course, are associated with managing risk. So if your client's not a risk taker, then, you know, certainly those are going to be rewards to your client. And then the concept or the idea of actually striking a good deal. So what I would say to you folks out there as litigants 
it's okay to start with fear in mediation, but ultimately, in some respects, we want to move to reward. Now, here are the areas that comprise basically what we're going to call the social brain. We've got the um, medial prefrontal cortex, we've got the amygdala, we've got the PCC, which is the post-singulated cortex, we've also got the anterior insula insular cortex, and the fusiform gyrus. So now we're moving away from talking about the emotional brain, and we're going to talk about the social brain. Now, I think you're going to find this topic to be as interesting as the emotional brain. We've already talked about the amygdala. I don't really want to say much more about it here other than to say it's very interesting. Research has shown that the size of the amygdala is correlated with one's social network, whether that social network is physical in nature or whether it is even online. They have found correlations between that. And um, the couple things about the medial prefrontal cortex, because we've already talked a little bit about the PFC, but, but the medial portion of the PFC deals with norms and scripts. Um, a script would be like a greeting. You know, it, you go to a party and you know what to say. Well, the reason you know what to say is because this particular part of your brain has learned what you do when you go to a party. And norms are more, uh, more moral related or evaluative in nature. So those are the things that tell us what is and is not acceptable within certain social settings. And then we have a real interesting concept that is played out here in the MPFC, which is theory of mind. And there's another term for that, which is called mental attribution. And what it is, is it's our mental ability to determine what others think, or at least to attribute to them what they're thinking or feeling. And this is very important, as you'll see later on, for the concept of empathy. And then in-group and out-of-group, this is where that is processed as well. In-group means this person is like me, I relate to them, and out-of-group means you know, I don't fit with this person. I, I can't relate to this person. They're not like me. Now, the um, PCC is involved in memory and emotion, and scientists think that it might play a role in cognition, but they're really not sure what that role is. There is, though, a consensus that it plays a role in what we call self-referential processing. And this is the part of your brain where you're saying to yourself, who am I? Am I social? Am I likable? Am I smart? Who am I? And then this part of the brain also gets involved in perspective taking, which is who are you? You know, are you nice? Are you a good lawyer? Are you a smart lawyer? So that we have both the ability to understand who we are and who others are. The anterior insular cortex is involved in empathy and compassion and other interpersonal phenomena like fairness and cooperation. And we're going to talk about both fairness and cooperation in a few minutes. And then, of course, the um, FG or the fusiform gyrus is involved in color, body, face, words. And um, we are, interesting fact here, we are born with the ability to recognize faces. So when you look down at that little baby and that little baby smiles at you and you've known that baby for a month or so, that baby knows who you are. They recognize, the, the human being has the ability to recognize faces from the time of birth. And you know, if you think about it, it's a, it's a very important survival mechanism. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about social systems. Um, you know, that's basically the relationships between individuals, groups, and institutions, and then also formal organization, status, role, or I, I actually like to look at it in terms of hierarchy. And both of those exist within any social setting. They're always there. They may be unspoken, 
they may be subtle, but they exist in any social setting. So that, that exists within mediation as well. So really, there's, if you want to break it down, there's really three aspects. There's the relational aspect, which is the one-to-one. -one. There's the socialization, which is, you know, how do you fit in terms of a group? What's, you know, where are you in terms of group dynamics? And then, of course, we talked about status, or what I'm going to refer to as hierarchy. Now, all three of these are in play in mediation. Think about this. There's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between a lawyer and a client. So there's the relational aspect. There may be a one-on-one -on -one relationship between mediator and client because sometimes, you know, I, I had a case recently where it involved business people and basically most of my discussions in my private session were with the principals of the business. The lawyers were there to provide legal guidance, but it was the principals who were very active um, in discussing the facts and discussing the various aspects of their businesses. So we've got a group setting, obviously, in mediation, in our private and joint sessions. We have hierarchy there, too, because if you think about it, the mediator walks in, and they're basically in control of the process. The lawyers are taking the lead, so I would say that they're either equal or slightly below the mediator in terms of the hierarchy. And then the clients typically are one layer below that. Even though they're the decision makers and even though they're the ones that we have mediation for, there is, there is a well-established hierarchy within the mediation process. And, you know, we talk a lot about empowerment in mediation. And, of course, I'm sure you can understand that social hierarchy certainly affects one's perspective on the power that they have. And of course, the higher up in social hierarchy, the greater the feelings of power that one would have. Now we're going to take a quick look at fear and reward from a social standpoint. And Sandy, this was fascinating to me because I never realized that social fears have exactly the same chemical and emotional impact on us as people um, that physical fears do. So as an example, one of the greatest social fears that people have is speaking in public. It's on any list, you'll see it probably in the top ten. Right behind snakes um, for me. There, and you know that that's what I was going to use as my example. So let's say that you're afraid of snakes and you're also afraid of public speaking. When you see the snake, your body is producing the exact same chemicals as when you go to give that speech. So, you know, you're having, you're experiencing exactly the same thing. The, the only other thing I want to point out on here, because it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, is there's a term there, and it's on the right-hand side under social reward, and it's called schadenfreude, and I, and I hope I'm saying it right. I've never heard Shaden of that. I'm waiting to hear what that means. <laughs> <laughs> well, li literally, it means harm joy, and so what it means is that you derive pleasure from the misfortunes of others. Now, in the class that I took, my professor didn't explain it that way. He said that it's not sadism because, you know, that's where you basically torture others or you get pleasure from seeing others suffer. Um, but, but what this is really is this is that, that feeling that we've all had where we look at somebody that's been terribly injured or they've really fallen upon some terrible misfortune and we have a feeling inside that says, boy, I'm glad that's not me. Um, so that, that's how my professor described it and, you know, so I figured I would share that with you folks. 
I have just taken control of the webinar um, or of the PowerPoint, Michelle, so take it back from me. The reason why I took it was that we've gotten a couple questions. All of them are expressing an interest in your PowerPoint presentation. So I know typically after our webinars, we post our uh, the recording of it on our website, www-adr.com. But Kathy in our office typically also puts the PowerPoint on SlideShare. So we'll have to discuss that internally and decide if that's what you want to do. But you do have several people that are expressing an interest in getting a copy of your PowerPoint presentation. And I, and I would be fine with that. I'm perfectly happy to do that. As you can see on each of the slides, I've tried to identify my sources because, you know, I'm, I really am not making this stuff up. <laughs> I, I really did get this from these various sources. I think but, this stuff um, comes in the you can't make this stuff up category, you can't, for sure. You can't make it up. No, you can't. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. Can you, there you go. That's okay. okay. So now I want to talk to you about unfairness. Now, and, and we encounter this a lot in mediation, right? Yes, I mean, this is, this is This is probably an element of almost every single dispute or mediation that we have. You and I discussed this in advance, too. I think this comes up in particular. It's very acute in global settlements when you've got several different people, perhaps with different levels of injury from the same incident, if you will. And I've seen it a lot in that, in that context. Yeah, no, no doubt, Sandy. And and this is almost if you if you look at the timeline here with the picture, this is almost innate with us. I mean, you have if, if you think back to your first experience when you remember something being unfair, I'm gonna bet that you can't remember how back that feeling goes. And the reason you can't is because it your first experience of unfairness happens sometime between you being the ages of one and two years old. So, you know, we, we basically carry with us, you know, our entire life this concept of unfairness. And what it does is it creates a conflict between, re remember, the amygdala is always associated with the emotional brain and cortical process, that's associated with the cognitive brain. So we have a conflict here, and I'm going to, I'm going to use Sandy today um, to give us a little bit of example. Imagine that I am presenting this live in front of an audience, and I'm standing at the podium, and I ask Sandy to come up to the podium, and I ask, let's say, Kathy to come up to the podium, and I basically say, look, you know, out of the goodness of my heart, I would like to give both of you a reward today. And Sandy, I'm going to give you $10, and Kathy, I'm going to give you $20. Sandy, what's your first response to that? that that's not fair. I, I don't understand that. Why am I not getting the same amount as her? We're both your friends. Okay, now that response, Sandy, is coming from your emotional brain. You are not even, I mean, you're processing it from, you know, in the cognitive brain because obviously you spoke to us about it, but your very first feeling about it is coming through your emotional brain, through your amygdala. And, but the, the, cogn the cognitive aspect of this is that you are now $10 richer than you were before you walked up here. So from a purely rational standpoint, it's a gift, and there's really no reason why you should be experiencing unfairness. But you have to understand that the affair unfairness is an emotional response, and you know, you're, you're having to then, with your cognition, temper that emotional response by your reasoning. I think what we talked about too, Michelle, and um, it especially hits home with me, and I was telling you about my son too, there are certain people when you take personality tests that, that gauge this that value fairness and justice more strongly than other people. And I think it's important when you're uh, representing your client at mediation to figure out uh, where your client is on that scale because you need to relate to that person differently um, or in a, in a more unique manner than you would with a person who doesn't have that as a priority for them. My, my six-year-old and I both very much value fairness and justice and right and wrong and equality and there are and that's not a good thing or a bad thing it's just a, a, a 
just the way we were born, I think, and um, other people don't. So as a litigator, it's very important to figure that out so you can speak your client's language. Oh, I, I think that's absolutely true, and I think there is a large element of that 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 is how people's brains are wired differently. And then there may be some element of just their upbringing and their socialization. You know, scientists to this day don't agree on the distribution between what's nature and what's nurture. But, but as we're doing these functional MRIs of the brain, scientists are learning more and more and more about how we are just wired a certain way. So I want to talk a little bit now about status. It's, it's interesting here. This is another thing that develops early on and even earlier than unfairness. Remember, unfairness was somewhere between 19, I think it was 19 and 21 months, and status is developing as early as 14 months. Um, you know, if you look at our little picture here, can you understand the importance of knowing your status within a group. You know, obviously we have the little dog is the lower one on the chain, and obviously the adult male is the highest on the chain. And then, of course, we look at the little baby and the little girl, and if, if any of you have had children, you know that, that there is a recognition of status. Um, this affects us all the time in everything that we do we may not be conscious as it or sorry conscious of it but it does affect our decision making and probably the greatest impact it has is on power the higher the status the more the power the lower the status the lower the power we're going to take a look now at some of the uh, the relationship between power and behavior. And when you start looking at these two columns and comparing them, I think you're going to find a correlation with fear and reward. If you look on the left-hand side, you can see down number three, attentive to rewards under the high power and attentive to threats under the low power. So how does this inform us then in mediation? Well, obviously, what we're seeing is folks who come from a high power status are probably going to do better in mediation, not only because they have more power, but because they're operating from a reward posture as opposed to a fear posture, and our cognition our cognitive capabilities and our collaborative capabilities are up when we are operating from a reward posture versus a threat posture. So these power differences almost always exist in mediation, almost always. And you know, this is something that we're schooled on as mediators, and it's our responsibility not to balance power because we really can't do that, but what we can do is provide a process that is balanced. You know, we're not, we're not going to be able to take a high-level executive in a mediation context and remove from them their power and grant it to an employee who is a low-level employee who might be involved in a discrimination suit against the company. But what we as mediators can do is provide a process that is balanced. And, and we often do that, Sandy, in the mediation process. We try. <laughs> yeah, we do. Now, now, who do you guys think, you know, Sandy, who do you think typically achieves a better outcome at mediation, a high power person or a low power person? Well, I think, uh, I think the perception is that the high power person does, and I think that explains why sometimes the lawyers come in guns a-blazing. And uh, I think I'm experiencing in mediation that sometimes the quieter, gentler soul um, wins the day. It's just a matter of technique and who your audience is, right? 
Yep, definitely. Of course, that, that gentle soul, um, there are a lot of reward characteristics going on there, right? And somebody who is attentive to rewards oftentimes feels in a position of power because that you know they're not displaying fear because they feel like they possess power and here here's a little bit of the physiology on it when we are in a high power mode we have elevated testosterone we have decreased cortisol we have feelings of power not only not only are we powerful we have feelings of power and therefore we have a greater tolerance for risk whereas in the low power it's just the opposite it, and it, it wouldn't be a complete presentation without talking a little bit here about eye contact, too. Um, and I thought it was interesting that with animals and people, it's kind of an opposite. It's a little bit of an opposite thing. Like, I found that unusual, too. I, I would have thought it would have been the same, but it's, it's not. Well, yeah, animals, for animals, um, a direct gaze basically speaks dominance, period. Um, now... You know, it, you, you see on the slide that unless and until it's sustained, so if it's a direct gaze for a short period of time, you know, not as much dominance. But if it's sustained, then it's a challenge for dominance. So then we look over at, you know, what does eye contact mean for people? It is fundamental for establishing trust, rapport, and respect in the mediation process and with your clients and with opposing lawyers um, and in social settings at parties and things like that and so what I would recommend that you do is make sure when you shake the hand of opposing counsel when you shake the hand of the opposing party when you're meeting them when you're in contact with them shake their hand but also look at them in the eyes make that connection with them now, there's a balance here because if you have sustained eye contact, it, it just like in the animal world, it does represent a challenge for dominance. And, and I think we can, if we really give this a little bit of thought, I think we can all relate to it because we've had times where people have stared at us and it made us extremely uncomfortable. The thing that I think is very cool about autonomy is that, and autonomy is just defined as the perception of self-governance, is it's, it's a perception issue. So to me, this one's really interesting because it's really not how autonomous you are. It's how autonomous you perceive you are. So with respect to autonomy, perception is definitely reality. And feeling autonomous is very positive. It makes us feel good. And, you know, here are some of the physiological aspects of autonomy. We're empowered when we choose. So when your clients are in mediation and they're making choices, they're empowered. They may not always like the choices that they have, but the fact that they are the ones making them is empowerment. It also strengthens our ego to make choices. And of course, we suffer when we have no autonomy. Um, you know, if you've ever seen somebody in an abuse situation um, where they feel oppressed, you can see how people suffer when they feel they have no autonomy. But I thought this was interesting too, Sandy, that culture really plays a significant role here. And um, I mean, you know, what would you guess about our culture that we're collectivist or individualistic? Well, I think that typically Americans are deemed to be individualistic. Yeah, ab absolutely. All you have to do is look at what's going on in Nevada. Um, of course, there are some collectivist elements there, too, with all those cowboys. And, um, but there's a lot of individualism going on there, too. But, but basically, the more collectivist a culture the less important it really is to be autonomous, which you can kind of understand that because if um, your culture is is uh, centered around the whole as opposed to the individual, then it's not as important to be autonomous. But 
kind of bringing it home to what we do on a daily basis, autonomy is very important in mediation. And we as mediators and you folks as lawyers can help parties feel, because it is about perception, that they have autonomy by helping them see that they not only have the power to choose, but that they have choices that are available to them. You know, Michelle, it's it's so important because, uh, I mean, th these numbers bear out. Clients are choosing um, to settle their cases, and this is not a mystery to you and to me. That's why mediation was developed. But I just recently learned that there were over 320,000 uh, circuit civil matters filed in the state of Florida in, um, uh, let's say, June from 2012 to June of 2013. Less than 1% of those were resolved with a jury trial. And I can only assume it's because we have an active mediation system and clients would rather have choices and be the decision maker than to put it in the hands of, of people, individuals other than themselves. Yeah, well, you know, it's, we go back to autonomy. It's ego enhancing. I mean, pe people like being autonomous in our culture. It's important to them. I'm just briefly going to touch on empathy and in-group. We talked real briefly about in-group and out-of-group. In-groups where you're like a person. Out-of-group is where you view them as different from you. And when functional MRIs of the brain are conducted, it, it shows that there's increased brain activity for empathy when you are experiencing something in-group versus out-of-group. So I want to talk just a little bit more about empathy because it, it is an important aspect of just being human. Um, it also is an important aspect of, in terms of what we do and what we see on a daily basis. Here's what's happening. There are mirror neurons that are triggered in your brain when you see someone sad, angry, happy. Um, you know, have you ever noticed that you tend to smile? at someone when they first smile at you, uh, this is somewhat of an automatic response. It's not really conscious. And, and these are mirror neurons that are causing us to do this because what we're doing is we're experiencing what we would experience if we were actually that person we're observing. So there's a few things that are necessary to actually feel empathy. One, you have to be in an effective state, which is an emotional state. You have to feel something. So if you're not feeling something, you're not having empathy. The, you also have to have a state that's identical to another person. And basically, you've chosen that feeling. You've, you've elected, by virtue of observing them or imagining how they feel, you've elected that feeling yourself. And that feeling is, in fact, coming from another person. And all of these elements are necessary to experience empathy. And let's see, I think. I took, I took the thing. I was answering some questions. Sorry, Michelle. Uh, it's OK. Huh. Can you get it back? There you go. Oh, yeah. OK. So, you know, not surprisingly, and based on what, what we saw for the functional MRI, if you're out of group, if you can't relate to that person, there's a good chance there's going to be an empathy gap. You're not going to feel empathy for them. Um, also, if you are in a non-effective state, I, here I put no effective state, but bottom line, we as judges, lawyers, and, and mediators, you know, we have to work in a non-effective state at, oftentimes in order, in order to function. I mean, you know, we can't, we can't cry and get sad every time we see something that makes us feel sad in our work or in mediation, or we wouldn't be able to function cognitively. So empathy is a wonderful thing in a personal setting. It's very important within relationships, but it's not, and we're going to talk in a minute about why it's not necessarily the best feeling you want to have in a professional setting. So a couple little things, and again, I didn't make this stuff up. You know, this was researched, and the source is on there. Um, there has been some research done that 
that women are generally a little bit more empathetic than men, and um, women tend to be able to be empathetic even for people that they perceive to be unfair, um, which I thought was kind of interesting, whereas um, men distinguish there, and they do not have as much empathy for people that they perceive to be unfair. And I, I kind of brought that home even in my, in my own life, and I thought, you know, if somebody wrongs me, um, I can kind of step back sometimes and I can kind of evaluate it and say, well, maybe they were thinking this and maybe they were feeling this and blah, blah, blah. But my husband will, you know, he will be pretty much just like what the research says, which is they tend to, you know, want revenge for somebody that has, you know, has been, who has treated me unfairly. And I, and I find that to be kind of an interesting difference between men and women, and we could spend, you know, hours and hours and hours talking about, and we, and we are going to touch on some of the differences between men and women, but we're probably just going to touch on them. So, so here's something I want you to take away from this presentation. I want to define perspective taking because it is different than empathy. It is the active consideration of another's viewpoint. Perspective taking in negotiation and mediation is very important because in order to do a deal, it's helpful for you to understand the other side's perspective because then it helps you understand what their interests are and how you can maybe meet those interests in the context of a settlement. So bottom line, perspective taking increases the ability in mediation to find hidden agreements. Empathy can be detrimental. So here's what you want to do. You want, you want the other side to feel empathy towards you and your client, but when it comes to your view of the other side and their position, and their position you want to perspective take. So because when you feel empathy, you're in an effective state, and we don't want you, or, or you don't want to be in an effective state in mediation. You want to be in a cognitive state. And perspective taking is cognitive, but empathy moves you over to the emotional state. We talked briefly about theory of mind and mental attribution, and uh, so I'm not going to touch on that at this point. But Keep in mind that everybody's brain is wired differently, and if your brain is not accurate in determining the state of mind to attribute to another person, then you might not have a very great capacity for empathy. And that is why I'm sure you've known people who were not empathetic, and basically the, what I call it, the way I refer to it, is it's like reading people. You know how it, it varies among people. There are some people who can look at someone and look at their expressions and size them up and basically know what they're feeling. And then there are other people who can look at that same person and really not have a clue. And, and that, that definitely, the ability to do that um, really affects somebody's ability to have empathy. If you, if you can't figure out what someone else is feeling, you certainly cannot have empathy. We talked a little earlier, you know, about dopamine. Um, we talked about the fear hormones. Uh, we also have certain neurotransmitters and hormones that come into play and are activated when we have cooperation. And you see them listed there. Um, oxytocin, this is a chemical. It's a hormone, basically. It's called the cuddle hormone or the bonding hormone. It's secreted on lactation, so nursing mothers, touch, and orgasm. And uh, so hopefully, you know, hopefully none of those are happening in a mediation, <laughs> but you know, I guess it could. So I don't know, you know, maybe you should tell all your clients to have sex before they come to mediation. I don't know, maybe they'd be in a good mood and <laughs> who knows what kind of result you'll end up with. But um, <laughs> we, you know, and we've all heard about um, serotonin, 
you know, we hear a lot about serotonin. If anybody's familiar with anxiety disorders or anti-anxiety medication, um, serotonin is the hormone lack thereof, basically, that's um, involved in depression and anxiety. So we need to have a certain amount of serotonin t to have a feeling of happiness and well-being. And uh, most of the anti-anxiety medications that are out there today, the way that they work is they, re they uh, inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. So what that means is they prevent serotonin from being taken up out of the synapse so that the serotonin actually stays in the, in the neural synapse longer and more serotonin is, is absorbed. And then we already talked about the dopamine, but it also plays a role in, in regulating mood and appetite and sleep. So again, you've got all these chemicals, all these neuro transmitters, hormones in operation while we're walking around on a daily basis. So now we're going to turn our attention. We've talked about the emotional brain. We've talked about the social brain. And now we're going to turn our attention to cognition, the cognitive brain. We already talked a little bit about how this part of the brain regulates emotions. You know, remember Phineas Gage, it inhibits inappropriate actions. It's also responsible for creative thought. And, you know, we once thought that you know, if you were right brain, you were creative, and if you were left brain, you were intelligent. And bottom line is, if you're creative, you're intelligent, and if you're intelligent, you're probably creative too. So there's not so much of a bifurcation there as we originally thought. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about stress. You know, um, this is the effect that stress has on the brain, cognition. So bottom line is if you're over on the left-hand side, you may be experiencing fatigue and boredom. There's not enough stimulus um, or there's not enough going on with your brain chemicals to really involve you that much, to, to produce much thought process. And then if you have too much stress, and too much of a release of these stress chemicals, you'll be over here on the right-hand side. And I know that all of you have seen this happen with your clients, where they are so overwhelmed, they have such a huge stress response that they really can't think. And, and I'm sure you've been there as well sometimes when you've had stressful events in your life. So, what, so optimally, what we're looking for with folks in mediation is we want them to be at the top of that curve. And, and I'm going to cover some other things, too, that you can apply directly, you know, in the mediation setting. I know we've all had that feeling where all of a sudden you just know the answer. It just becomes crystal clear to you. And that, that's the concept of insight. And that's, a, that's an instant knowing. It's typically not a progression of logical ideas to a conclusion. It's just like, wow, I got it. I know the answer. And we can generate this in mediation and in negotiation, but you can't generate it unless you put people's brains at rest. And so here are some ideas, you know, on this slide about how you can go about doing that. Basically putting people's brains in more of a restful state so that they really can get into that realm of being able to have some insight. Now here's a topic that I've done a lot of research on, cognitive biases. And, and all I'm going to do here today is just define them for you. You see up here seven of the most common ones that you're going to encounter. Because um, we re this is a whole segment of information. This is a whole nother one hour seminar or or and and actually it is in in an article that I've written and it's going to be published in the June, July, and August bar briefs. 
that that's just this year, just this summer, it's supposed to come out. Coming but in a webinar I, soon, right? Well, I think we may do that as well. We <laughs> haven't figured out when, but I think we're maybe looking towards the fall to do that. So stay tuned, everybody. But um, all a cognitive bias is is an error in judgment. And the bottom line is we all have limitations, and those limitations lead us to systematic errors in judgment. And when I say systematic, I mean ones that we're prone to on a regular basis. And it's not because we lack intelligence, but it's just that we're human, and so we're subject to a multitude of biases. And I'm just, like I said, just making you aware of them, and, you know, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to share some more about that you know, in an upcoming segment in the fall. Something you've all got to take into consideration is fatigue. And, you know, the fatigue we're worried about in mediation is decision fatigue. So, you know, you need to consider the time of day for your clients when you set a mediation. You need to consider, you know, are you a morning person? Are you better in the morning than the afternoon? Or are you more alert and do you think better in the afternoon than in the morning? And, you know, even though we've all had those midnight mediations, um, I think there's some real risk there in, in having people just not having their cognitive capabilities at a place where they need to be for good decision making. So, you know, we just need to recognize that we are human and, and we run out of gas and um, we have to be sensitive to that. Michelle, I saw that you put on the glucose levels, there's a mediation group in Nashville and they have taken all sugary processed products out of their uh, waiting rooms and refrigerators and lunches. And they only provide organic snacks and fruit and juices without added sugar because they are really buying into the, they don't want people on sugar highs. They want people processing, you know, literally, naturally. And they take it very seriously at that firm. Well, you know, I have read about that, Sandy, and I've seen that advocated, but, you know, people just, that sugar sure makes people happy. <laughs> it makes me it happy. It sure <laughs> releases a lot of dopamine, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so we're going to talk in a few more effects on the cognitive brain here. You know, intuition, which really, you know, it's really just pattern recognition. It is a gut feeling because it's not something that you cognitively have to think through to arrive at. Um, but the reason you have the gut feeling is that you've seen a similar situation so many times that it's like you just know the answer. And I think it's important for us as practitioners to be aware of the effects of stress on people too. Um, you know, it has physical effects on your clients. These can be bone demineralization, metabolic syndrome, impaired immunity, arteriosclerosis, and cognitively it affects us. It affects our ability to concentrate, our ability to remember, our ability to learn. And emotionally, I thought this was kind of fascinating. We're back to the amygdala again. Um, the amygdala, stress, sustained stress to the amygdala can actually make it grow and make it more sensitive to future stress so that it takes less stimulus to really upset someone. And I think we've all seen this where certain people, they're just so stressed out that, you know, everything makes them stressed out. And, uh, you know, those are probably people who have sustained some kind of stress damage in their brains. So mindfulness is important. And <clears throat> one of the things I learned <clears throat> in this course is that there's really no such thing as multitasking. We think we're multitasking, but the truth is our brains can really only focus on one thing at a time. And they have found that focusing on one thing at a time is more restful for your mind. So when you're in mediation, do try to stay focused really only on what you're doing there. And you'll probably do a better job. And you will 
be more restful. You will be in a better cognitive place because you're not trying to do a million things at once and be distracted. Talk a little bit about um, the brain and age and aging. And we all, we all know um, the deal with teenagers. Uh, obviously, their emotional and cognitive brain are out of sync in these teenage years. And somehow, the girls, the gap between the cognition and the emotion does come together a little more quickly for the girls than it does for the boys. And if you've ever represented somebody who's 22 to 25, you will know that these people are your bigger risk takers. They're also very high reward seeking. And this just has to be, this has to do with their brain development. And Sandy, I guess this is why my daughter, who's 22, can't wait to go skydiving. And I'm still, quote, thinking about it after about two years. I'm not even thinking about it. What does that make me? <laughs> Michelle, we have about three or four minutes left, so uh, I hate to hurry you along because I'm so intrigued by what you're saying. But we need to, we need to, um, we need to move it along. I guess maybe do a continuation. Well, I'll tell you what. I can certainly wrap up in about five minutes if I've got that. Okay, you do. Yeah, we we now move to some gender differences, and and hey, you know, I I didn't make this stuff up. Um, one, two, three, four, five. The top five of these, they're biological. Um, they just are what they are. We're just made that way. The fifth one, to me, is a little bit more social in origin, but they are interesting and could form the topic of, you know, and could give us fodder for, you know, a whole new topic. Another interesting thing about gender differences is women really can't successfully mirror or you know copy male negotiating styles we have to negotiate in a way that is comfortable uh, in our own skin it's probably the best way to put it and this statistic Sandy the seven percent of women ask for more money in response to an initial job offer while 57 percent of men do that is um, a lean in that came that, from the book of lean in. That is a lean in issue. We're going to be talking yeah. about that next week. It is, and um, the the last one, women are offered less money and reward for the same task. Interestingly enough, both men and women will offer women less money or reward for the same task. So go figure. I don't I don't have the answer for that. You know, it just is what it is, and these last two slides here deal with male and female negotiating styles. And bear in mind that what this author has done is she has picked out what she sees as the pluses on the female side and the male side. Now, when you look at these, you'll see there's a lot of characteristics in female negotiating styles that actually would make them good mediators. A cooperative view, a win-win, they recognize and, and like the idea of applying process or rules to a dispute. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more big picture. Now, these are all generalities, of course, um, but I did pick this up from an article I read. What I have noticed for sure, Michelle, is that women do come to the table typically with a uh, cooperative view and with what, what what you need something, I need something, let's work on that together. And uh, I find that very refreshing and very, very productive. Yeah, well, we, there's no doubt that we're different, Sandy, and we certainly do have our strengths. And the I really found the male negotiating, the pluses on the male negotiating style to be really, really interesting too. Um, you know, men have a bargaining advantage because they believe that they do. Because they believe that they do, they possess a bargaining advantage. They also have, they tend, again, these are all generalities, but they tend to have a stronger sense of entitlement which, you know what that does, it causes them to aim higher in a negotiation. Um, they tend to be more bold in speaking up. 
they tend to feel that they're entitled to information and that they have the right to get it. They believe that they deserve power and so therefore they seek it. And they, they sound, they can often sound as if they know more than the opposing party and they seem to know more because they're better at making it sound as if they do. Now again, I didn't I didn't make these things up. All of this is from this article that I've read. And I've not only seen this in this particular article, but I've also seen it in other sources as well. So. I see it in my marriage, Michelle. I swear my husband and I are both equally skilled lawyers, and I cannot win an argument in my own home. I, <laughs> and he, just, he, he just has this way about him that I go, I give up. I give up. Let's just stop having the well, conversation. Well, you know, to me, here's the beauty of it, is that we we can learn things from each other. You know, that the men can learn some things from us and we as women can learn some things from the men. Absolutely. So, you know, well, I, I hope that this has been helpful and I would be happy to entertain any questions. Let How me see if we, that? let me see if we have any, Michelle. I'm going to look and see if we've got, um, uh, let's see what we've got here. We uh, answered. Uh, we don't. We don't really have. We did say that uh, someone did um, uh, join in. Actually, that was Richard. He's so funny. He says we have fruit and salad at lunch too, and nuts. You know, <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to keep the glucose levels <laughs> even. So, thank you, Richard. But um, everyone, please jot down the Florida bar number. It's. Uh, I believe that's one four zero one four seven five. N. Again, 140-1475-N. And, of course, if you did not, it, were not able to jot that down or had to leave a little bit early, please um, email uh, Kathy Klasny at our office. Uh, her email is there on the screen. Uh, C. Klasny, K-L-A-S-N-E at uww-adr.com. If you have any questions for Michelle regarding her content today, and I hope that you do, please email. Um, email Michelle or call her at the, at the office and she will talk you through your inquiry and your question and get it answered. That's very important to us. Now for some upcoming things, we do have some upcoming stuff. We are probably not going to be offering anything in May as far as a webinar is concerned because we are doing two in April. We have Michelle's wonderful presentation today and then we have one next week that I am doing concerning leaning in. We're stepping outside of the box a little bit and we're going to be addressing women lawyers leaning into their profession. But We're opening up to other professionals as well and we are encouraging people of both genders to attend because men can help women lean in and should be aware of those issues to mentor them and move them along in their quest for leadership in law firms or in corporate America. So we ask you to join in for that. Um, if you have an idea for a webinar, I'm just going to throw this out there, and a topic that you would like to present, hey, email me at uh, supchurch at uww-adr.com. I'd be very happy to put something together for you in the month of May. We'd want to talk about it here and make sure that it's uh, dispute resolution related, but go ahead and send it our way, and we will talk about it and get back with you, or give me a call and let me know know what your idea is. As for June, our, our monthly offerings continue. John Upchurch is offering a webinar on the topic of arbitration. We will have more coming up in the months, the summer months, and um, we will offer one every single month. Michelle, you did a phenomenal job. The comments that I'm getting from people are how unbelievably well prepared you were, um, how fascinating the information was. So thank you. I think this was one of our most informative topics, and it was a little bit of a, um, a change up from what we usually do. And it was refreshing and wonderful, and you did a phenomenal job. Thank you so much. Well, Sandy, thank you. I couldn't have done it without you hosting and getting me through the technical parts of it. And I really appreciated the opportunity to share what I find to be so interesting with, with those that I work with and friends and clients. So, Well, I think you uh, obviously have found your calling with mediation, but I think you would have been an equally phenomenal uh, doctor or psychiatrist <laughs> or psychologist as well. So thank you again to the um, uh, University of Florida Levin College 
College of Law Institute for Dispute Resolution. They are a great partner with us. Again, our next webinar will be April 24th at noon. We'll be discussing Cheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In. And my guest will be Maureen France from Daytona. She is a marketing director for a local physicians group and a big fan of Lean In. And my second guest is Elizabeth Schoonover from the McLeod Firm in St. Augustine. She's a lawyer and new mom, and she is living the Lean In life, as we are all hoping to be doing. So uh, please uh, listen in for our next topic and send us any topic or suggestions that you have. Please write down the Florida Bar course number, but we will help you after we make fun of you a little bit if you forget what it is or didn't write it down. Michelle, thank you. I'm going to conclude your client's brain in mediation. Thank everyone uh, for joining us. And from us, from Upchurch, Watson, White, and Max to all of you, we say ciao for now. Thank you. Bye, Thanks everyone. Again, Sandy. Bye, Michelle. Bye -bye. Thank you.